so uh, this is part two in a series that I'm doing on this book. The book is called The Morning After, uh, Sex, Fear, and Feminism. It is by the writer Katie Royfe. Uh, she achieved some degree of notoriety, particularly in political and literary circles and academia, uh, when she came out with this book. Uh, this book was seen to be a, a kind of internal challenge to some of the emerging and prevailing notions uh, of sexual harassment and, and things like that in feminism, in modern feminism. Basically, what she does in this book is she identifies, and this book was published in 1993 or 1994, uh, she identifies what we would come to know as the modern Me Too movement. And so even though she doesn't call it Me Too, uh, and she's not interested in like the, the emergence of this, the structure of the Me Too movement, she describes a number of the attitudes that we now find prevalent in our society, uh, a number of which are, are problematic and excessive. And so that's what this book is about. And so I started reading it in um, an earlier video. Check that out on YouTube uh, if you want to. And uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna spend more time reading because the last video, I spent a lot of time talking. This one, let's get going now. I just wanna say, uh, just like people like to say on Twitter, um, retweet does not equal endorsement. What I want to do in this series, what I wanna start doing is going through some books with you because that's what actually you know I'm trained to do, uh, be, be an English professor, right? So I wanna start going through some books that I find interesting and with you and reading excerpts and talking about them, but there are gonna be things that are gonna kinda come up with every book that I read or every, everything that I talk about that I, don't, that I don't agree with, right? So just understand that. I'm just giving us all a perspective that's interesting not necessarily endorsing all of it or whatever, okay? So the title of this uh, chapter is the, the Rape Crisis or Is Dating Dangerous? And again, I'm just going to be reading parts of it. She writes, according to the widely quoted Ms. survey, one in four college women is the victim of rape or attempted rape. One in four. I remember standing outside the dining hall in college looking at a purple poster with the statistic written in bold letters. It didn't seem right. Now remember, this writer, Katie Royfe, uh, she was the daughter of a major feminist writer. Uh, she was raised with feminism, basically, she said. She went to Harvard for her undergrad. Then she got her PhD in English literature from Princeton, which is, means that she's hell of a smart and hell of, hell of a um, elitist as well. In terms of, I don't mean her attitude. I just mean in terms of uh, being raised in a very elite environment. And so what we're looking at here is someone who should have entered the, the academic environment really welcoming these sort of emergent proto-MeToo narratives and, the, and attitudes, but instead she, start, she starts to feel like there's something wrong. Um, and there's a disconnect between how she feels as a woman or how she feels about feminism or how she thinks of feminism versus what she is seeing starting to emerge in the universities. And of course, you need to understand that a lot of the ideas and attitudes, particularly when it comes to things like, you know, gender and Me Too and all of that, um, they do have very strong roots in academia. And we all understand that there are certain parts or certain disciplines in academia that have very strong political agendas. Not, not all, right? I mean, I, I think engineering, you still just get an engineering degree, right, or whatever. But we do understand that, uh, particularly in the liberal arts, but not just in the liberal arts, you know, being like Michelle Dauber, sociology, or is sociology a liberal art? I should know that, but I don't. Anyway, point is, in some of these disciplines, they are very politicized, and this is where a number of these ideas about uh, gender relations and you know uh, uh, what what constitutes a sexual assault and things like coercion, even these ideas, you know, some of these ideas about like grooming that adult women can be groomed and, and, and so forth. Uh, also, ideas about you know gender that are now becoming popular, you know, this stuff has its roots, or at least partially in academia. So anyway, I said I wasn't going to talk, but I just want you to understand where she's coming from. So by being a, so, so much a part of this, right, she should have not, this writer, Katie Royfe, she shouldn't have had a problem with these ideas, but instead she finds herself very much having a problem with them. That's what she writes about. All right, I'm going to shut up. It didn't seem right. If sexual assault was really so pervasive, it seemed strange that the intricate gossip networks hadn't picked up more than one or two shadowy instances of rape. If I was really standing in the middle of an epidemic, a crisis, if 25% of my female friends were really being raped, wouldn't I know it? 
The answer is not that there is a conspiracy of silence. The answer is that measuring rape is not as straightforward as it seems. Now, what she's saying here is that she herself does not feel like, given the experiences and the conversations that she's had with women she's known and friends and whatever, that, that the statistic one in four is anywhere near right. She's just saying that that it doesn't... And as a number of people have pointed out, you know, that would be like basically a higher rape statistic than even living in a war zone, which is normally where rape tends to occur the most, right? Or the most, and the most sort of, um, uh, uh, well, shamelessly. And so the, the problem, as she says here, is that it's not as straightforward as it seems to measure it. And so she's going to talk about this famous survey. I'm going to continue, okay? Neil Gilbert, professor of social welfare at the University of California at Berkeley, has written several articles attacking the two sociological studies that are cornerstones of the rape crisis movement, the Ms. Magazine study and one done in the early 80s by Diana Russell. Now, she's going to talk about these two seminal studies, but and, and, and people will say, okay, but this, you just said this came out in 93 or 94. Surely there's been other studies. Yeah, there have been, and I'm going to talk about them on a later show. I, I've really, I, I've kind of talked about them earlier as well. Um, the studies, it's again, it's just not straightforward measuring this stuff, and a lot of it depends on how things are phrased, how they're contextualized, um, and and so forth. So anyway, I want to look at just what she says here because it's a good example of the point she's trying to make, which is the complicated nature of measuring these things and why a statistic like one in four has become just the, the dominant narrative statistic on this thing. Okay, it says, um, she says, uh, she says, having taken a closer look at the numbers, he, this professor, questions the validity of the one in four statistic. He points out that in the Ms. study, which is the one most frequently quoted, 73% of the women categorized as rape victims did not define their own experience as rape. In other words, they were asked if they were raped. They said no. Then they answered some other questions, and the person measuring, assessing the uh, questionnaire, then recategorized what they had said as, oh, this person was raped. Uh, it was Dr. based on their definitions, their own definitions. It was Dr. Marty Coase, the psychologist conducting the study, who did, who assigned this. These are not self-proclaimed victims then. These are victims according to someone else. From Coase's point of view, these women were suffering from what they used to call false consciousness. The way it is usually and tactfully phrased these days is that they don't recognize what has really happened to them. Uh, and, and of course, again, this is not, this is not every study, right? She's just talking about what for a, a while was a very important study, and it's just kind of an object lesson, okay? So I'm going to skip through a bit of this, okay? Uh, but for instance, she says, according to this professor, Gilbert, in the Ms. study, one of the questions used to define rape, and this is very common in these types of assessments, have you had sexual intercourse when you didn't want to because a man gave you alcohol or drugs? Now, several different ways of interpreting this. One way would be that a woman was drugged against her will, which clearly is rape, assault, whatever you want to call it, and I think is completely criminal and horrible, right? The other way of viewing it is that a man giving you, supplying you, like basically buying you drinks, right? Which happens very often, right? Or giving you the alcohol that, that you'll be drinking that night or taking you to a party where someone else is supplying the alcohol or if we're talking about drugs, right? It is, it is often, not always, or you, but it is often a guy and a couple, a guy will be the one to procure it, right? And so my point being that just because someone would give someone something and then that person would would get into an altered or impaired state, and then the two were to have sex. As long as the as long as the uh, both people in that equation appear, are conscious and appear to be in control of themselves, just just taking something under the influence, even if someone did give it to you, that's not automatically assault. But the point is that this study was coding it that way, and you do at times in a number of these types of studies, especially ones where you see these high rates of supposed assault and harassment and stuff, you do have to be very careful and look at the actual definitions. Okay, I'm going to get back into what she's saying here. The strange phrasing of this question itself raises the issue of agency. Why aren't college women responsible for their own intake of alcohol or drugs? A man may give a woman drugs, but she herself decides to take them. 
A pamphlet about acquaintance rape gives the following as an example of a rape scenario. Quote, a woman is at a party and is very drunk. A man, whom she knows through a friend, has had a few drinks with her. He leads her into an unoccupied room in the house. They begin to make out, and he feels as if she is responding to him. They have sex. He leaves her in the room, asleep or passed out, and returns to the party. Then she says, the idea that women get too drunk to know what they are doing while men stay sober and lucid. That doesn't make sense. If we assume women are not all helpless and naive, then shouldn't they be held responsible for their choice to drink or take drugs? If a woman's judgment is impaired, as they say, and she has sex, it isn't necessarily always the man's fault. It isn't necessarily always rape. Many of these instances, as Gilbert points out, are simply too vague for statistical certainty. Classifying a positive answer to Coase's ambiguous question as rape further explains how she could have reached the conclusion that one in four women on college campuses has been raped. And then she says, uh, no matter how one feels about this, this critique, Gilbert's research shows that these figures are subjective, that what is being called rape is not always a clear-cut issue of common sense. Whether or not one in four college women has been raped, then, is a matter of opinion at times, not necessarily a matter of mathematical fact. Everyone agrees that rape is a terrible thing, but we don't always agree on what rape is. There is a gray area in which someone's rape may be another person's bad night. Now, you know, I'll give you an example. Um, I don't know how many of you, well, there's just a couple, there's a couple that spring to mind, but there could be many, there's so many, many, many more that I have read in some of these Me Too uh, testimonials. Not all, maybe not even most, right? But look, um, that comedian, and I'm blanking on his name, but you probably know who I'm talking about, uh, right? Oh, God, I can't, I wish I could remember. But anyway, so there was that really, really ridiculous, really horrible uh, story that was written about a date that he had had with a woman who goes by the pseudonym of Grace in the article, Grace. And she talks about how uh, basically they met up and, ha and had dinner. He bought her dinner and they talked for a while and they went back to his, and this was after they'd met at a party. They went back to uh, either her apartment or his and he basically tried to start coming on to her physically, right? Nowhere in this article, in this testimonial, does this woman allege that he physically assaulted her or that he threatened her with violence or anything bad or in any way was she forced to do this or pressured other than just the pressure that happens when one person is coming on to another um, and the other is not as into it, right? Which they, call, which they like to call uh, now, people like to call coercion. Um, but it is not illegal to, to try to kiss someone unless, unless that person is showing that they do not want it. And that is, was what was missing entirely from Grace's account. She said a number of unflattering things about this comedian. Uh, she insulted like even his, uh, his kissing technique, as I remember, and she referred to a, a weird maneuver he did called the claw, where he would put the fingers inside the mouth and stretch it out before he tried to kiss her. I don't know. It was like embarrassing stuff. But it sounded like a bad date. And Ashley Banfield, who I don't know what she's doing now, but at that point she was an attorney, uh, she was a reporter, an anchor woman, anchor person for CNN, and really accomplished. And uh, anyway, she uh, she wrote about this. No, she did a she did a video on it, and she said, "You had a bad date. They happened. They've happened to me. This was not assault. Basically, like shame on you, right?" And which was which was very right. And I'm thinking about that, or I'm thinking about uh, the, um, the unfortunate thing that happened to Chris Hardwick, who was really a canary in a coal mine for some of this stuff that we would see. It was right at the beginning when Me Too, before Harvey Weinstein, but when things were starting to, to, uh, to get whipped up in this direction, right? And Chris Hardwick had uh, a, a former girlfriend, ex-girlfriend, who, whom I believe really does have borderline personality disorder, seems very similar in a number of ways to some of the others we've talked about. You know, these kinds of false accusations really do seem to be emerging as a kind of an MO uh, for some of these people. But anyway, 
She accused him of, of other things, of, of a number of things, basically amounted to being a bad boyfriend at times. But the most serious accusation and the one that the media ran with and the one that got him canceled and fired from everything in his life for a while, including the Nerdist podcast and web and organization or website or whatever it was that he even set up and it made a lot of people wealthy. But anyway, um, she alleged, the serious thing that she alleged was sexual assault, and that got all these headlines and got him fired and stuff, but guess what? When you actually read the essay that started this whole thing that, that this woman, Chloe Dykstra or Dykstra or whatever, had posted, it, he didn't force her at all. There was no, there was no uh, physical force. There was no threat of physical force. There was no threat of anything. What he did say, he reminded her that his previous relationship had uh, that one of the significant problems that it had, had was a lack of sex. And so he applied verbal coercion or verbal pressure, which as we know now today with these people, it gets translated into sexual assault. So that's the point. I think one of the points that she's trying to make here. Okay. I'm going to keep going. Okay. So she says, uh, Kay Royfe says, She says, rape is a natural Trump card. This was before Donald Trump campaign, okay? She says, rape is a natural Trump card for feminism. Arguments about rape can be used to sequester feminism in the teary province of trauma and crisis. They can block analysis with statements like, you can't possibly understand what I've been through. Declarations of rape are used as an insurmountable obstacle, a point beyond which no questions are allowed. Invoking the rape crisis, as Wolf and Brown Miller do, strengthens an argument by infusing it with heightened emotional appeal. For many feminists, then, rape becomes, and you, rape, not just rape, but sexual harassment and all these kinds of Me Too allegations, right? For many feminists, then, these types of allegations become a vehicle, a way to get from here to there. By blocking analysis with its claims to unique pandemic suffering, this crisis becomes a powerful source of authority. The idea of a rape or harassment epidemic has swollen beyond a few polemical passages. Although the rhetoric and statistics may be the stuff of airy political visions, they also affect real students and real financial decisions on college campuses. Universities channel money and resources, rooms, energy, and ideas into rape counseling and education programs and so on. Uh, and, and understand this was before we saw the emergence of like the, the dear colleague letter and a lot of these title nine, like tribunals and the, um, the 50, 50, 50, 50 plus a feather, uh, um, idea and all of that, that made, that made the way universities handle allegations of rape, uh, harassment, you know, much, much more problematic. So this was before that here she's, but she's describing what was even starting to be a problem at this point. Right. Okay, she writes, um, <clears throat> she writes, the fear of rape is not confined to university officials. It is not the kind of administrative worry that barely catches the attention of the average freshman. Students shout about it at take back the night marches. They talk about it over coffee. At a party, standing in the corner, one can hear two college sophomores talking about the danger of being raped by friends. One of them says a male friend of hers recently confessed that he was infatuated with her. Afterward, she let him drive her home. She trusted him. Nothing happened, thank God, she tells her friend over her plastic cup of red punch. But it scares me to think of what could have. It scares me to think that I trusted him after I knew how he felt about me. Yeah, the other one agrees. You have to stay in public places in situations like that. Dead serious, eyes wide with concern, one college senior tells me that she believes one in four is too conservative an estimate. This is not the first time I've heard this. She tells me the right statistic is closer to one in two. That means one in two women is raped. It's amazing, she says, amazing that so many of us are sexually assaulted every day. What is amazing is that this student actually believes 50% of women are raped. This is the true crisis, that there, are not a, that there are a not insignificant number of young women walking around with this alarming belief. This hyperbole contains within it a state of perpetual fear. A young woman asks a male friend to walk her three blocks back to her dorm at 8 o'clock in the morning. 
Half of all women are raped in their lifetime, and she cannot walk outside at night without that thought hovering in the windblown leaves, the shadowy corners, the empty cars. And then she starts talking about a pamphlet that she had gotten on campus. It says, acquaintance rape is dating dangerous. A pamphlet commonly found at counseling centers gives a sample date rape scenario. On the cover, the title rises from the shreds, from the shards of a shattered photograph of a boy and girl dancing. The pamphlet tells us what she is thinking and what he is thinking as the date progresses. She thinks, he was really handsome and he had a great smile. We talked and found we had a lot in common. When he asked me over to his place for a drink, I thought it would be okay. He was such a good listener and I wanted him to ask me out again. She's just looking for a sensitive boy, a good listener with a great smile, but unfortunately his intentions are not as pure as hers. Beneath his great smile, he is thinking, she looked really hot, wearing a sexy dress that showed off her great body. They start talking right away. He knows that she likes him because she keeps smiling and touching his arm while she's speaking. He thinks, she seemed pretty relaxed, so I asked her back to my place for a drink. When she said yes, I knew that I was going to get lucky. Going to get lucky. <laughs> uh, when they get to his room, the bed turns out to be the only place to sit in. Our innocent heroine thinks, I didn't want him to get the wrong idea, but what else could I do? They talk for a while, and then he makes his move. She is startled. He begins by kissing. She says she really liked him, so the kissing was nice. But then he pushes her down on the bed. She tries to get up and tells him to stop, but he was so much bigger and stronger. These cardboard stereotypes are not just educating freshmen about rape. They are also educating them about dates and about sexuality. With titles like Friends Raping Friends, Could It Happen to You?, Date rape pamphlets call into question all relationships between men and women. Beyond just warning students about rape, this movement produces its own images of sexual behavior in which men exert pressure and women always resist. By defining the dangerous date in these terms, with this type of male and this type of female and their different types of expectations, these pamphlets promote their own perspective on how men and women feel about sex. That is, men are always lascivious, they always want it, they're always predatory, and women are always innocent. With their practical advice, their sample scenarios, their sample aggressive male, their message itself projects a clear comment on the nature of sexuality. Women are often unwilling participants who say yes because they feel they have to because they are intimidated by male power. This is what so many of us, you know, Greta Aurora, the YouTuber Greta Aurora has done an excellent job of talking about this. Um, this is what a number of us who consider ourselves to be strong women, or at least that's what we aspire to, have a problem with, uh, with a lot of these Me Too narratives is that so many of them seek to infantilize women and they seem to present these sort of, um, of caricatures that is that I thought, you know, that I thought feminism was trying to get away from. And then she writes, the idea of consent has gone beyond the simple assertion that a no means no. Politically correct sex involves a yes and a specific yes at that. A new standard pamphlet on acquaintance rape warns men that hearing a clear, sober yes to the question, do you want to have sex, is very different from thinking, well, she didn't say no. She seemed into it, right? The yes must be clear. The yes must be sober. The idea of explicit permission has crept into rape crisis feminism and into the standard literature on the subject. According to the premise of active consent, we can no longer afford ambiguity. We can no longer afford the dangers of unspoken consent. A former director of Columbia's date rape education program told New York Magazine, quote, every time you have intercourse, there must be explicit consent, and if there's no explicit consent, then it's rape. Stone silence throughout a physical encounter with someone is not consent. This apparently practical, apparently clinical prescription cloaks retrograde assumptions about the way men and women experience sex. The idea that only an explicit yes means yes proposes that women, like children, have trouble communicating what they want. 
It proposes that words are likely to escape us as women, that we are likely to find ourselves tangled in situations where we can't assert our desires. Beyond its dubious premises about the limits of female communication, the idea of active consent bolsters stereotypes about men just out to get some and women who don't really want any. The American College Health Association's pamphlet tells men, quote, your desires may be beyond your control, but your actions are within your control. And it warns the female student to, quote, communicate your limits clearly. According to this picture of sexual relations, the female de desires are never beyond her control. The assumption embedded in the movement against date rape is our grandmother's assumption. That is, men want sex, women don't. In emphasizing this struggle, he pushing, she resisting, the rape crisis movement recycles and promotes an old model of sexuality. Another commonly distributed pamphlet about rape advises young women, quote, since you may not know who has the potential for rape, be on your guard with every man. This is another way of phrasing Susan Brown Miller's clever warning that, quote, the typical American rapist might be the boy next door. Such literature states that no man should be immune from suspicion. A book about rape issues the radical, myth-breaking warning that, quote, nice men do rape, and they do rape nice women. All of this suggests that we should subject all of our male friends to scrutiny because, after all, men want one thing and one thing only. The Is Dating Dangerous pamphlet and the others of its ilk are clearly designed to protect innocent college women from the insatiable force of male desire. This is the old sugar and spice approach to female character. We have been hearing about it for centuries. Uh, she talks more about sort of the history of, um, uh, of, of that. She says, by viewing, oh, and, um, okay, so she also says here, according to common definitions of date rape, oh, this, and so this is something, she was very, very, this writer, uh, Katie Roy, was very, very, um, very prescient in, in identifying this notion of verbal coercion that was going to eventually become very popular as another way of interpreting assault. She writes this, according to common definitions of date rape, even verbal coercion or manipulation constitutes rape. Verbal coercion is defined as, quote, a woman's consenting to unwanted sexual activity because of a man's verbal arguments, not including verbal threats of force. Katie Royfe writes, the belief that verbal coercion is rape extends beyond official definitions. It pervades workshops, counseling sessions, and student opinion pieces. In Harvard's moderate feminist magazine, The Lighthouse, a student wrote an impassioned piece about the prevalence of what she considered emotional rape. In an essay entitled Nonviolent Sexual Coercion, psychologists Charlie Mullenhard and Jennifer Scragg include the remarks, he said he'd break up with me if I didn't, he said I was frigid, and he said everyone's doing it in the category of verbal coercion. They go on to explain that, quote, a woman with low self-esteem might feel that if she refuses her partner's sexual advances, she will lose him and her value will be lessened because she is no longer associated with him, unquote. This is a portrait of the cowering woman knocked on her back by the barest feather of peer pressure. Solidifying this image of women into policy implies an acceptance of this passive role. By protecting women against verbal coercion, these feminists are promoting the view of women as weak-willed, alabaster bodies whose virtue must be protected from the cunning encroachments of the outside world. The idea that women can't withstand verbal or emotional pressure infantilizes them. The suggestion lurking beneath this definition of rape is that men are not just physically, but intellectually and emotionally more powerful than women. Imagine men sitting around in a circle talking about how she called him impotent and how she manipulated him into sex how violated and dirty he felt afterward, how coercive she was, how she got him drunk first, how he hated his body and he couldn't eat for three weeks afterward. Imagine him calling this rape. Everyone feels the weight of emotional pressure at one time or another. The question is not whether people pressure each other, but how that pressure is transformed in our mind and culture into full-blown assault. 
Very, very interesting. Um, yeah, so uh, um, a little bit more. Of course, uh, sophisticated modern-day feminists don't use words like honor or virtue anymore. They know better than to say rape victims have been defiled. Instead, they call it post-traumatic stress syndrome. They tell the victim she should not feel shame, she should feel traumatized. Within their overtly political psychology, forced physical penetration takes on a level of metaphysical significance. Date rape resonates through a woman's entire life. The idea that date rape remains with the victim, that it necessarily cripples her, that she can never trust men again, that she must be counseled and angry that society has done this to her, that rape culture and MTV and glamorized images of degraded women have done this to her, are part and parcel of the same old ethos of female victimhood. In institutionalizing the assumption that rape is universally life-threatening, feminists are institutionalizing female weakness. This kind of um, this kind of uh, assessment, you know, this is something that that will that really freaks out a lot of people because it, unless you're reading this with a discerning eye, you know, it sounds like to some people what she's saying here is that um, is that we should not we should not be concerned with things like PTSD or with the experiences the, of, of the horrible experiences and, and effects um, and psychological damage that occurs in rape. But that's not what she's saying here. She's talking, she's just spent all this time talking about the way that things that are really not rape, really not assault, have been recoded as such, even, even like verbal coercion. And she's saying that not only has society now recoded these things, but it's also telling women to really, really wallow in any kinds of feelings about that supposed victimization that they may have. So it's kind of a, what she's saying is that it's basically like a, a double whammy in here. Um, okay. Uh, it's, it gets more interesting. In the next installment, she's going to now talk about race. And I think that where race and uh, gender arguments or where race and Me Too, I should say, intersect, it's very, very interesting because there are very strong arguments that have been made that the excesses of Me Too and the, some of the problems inherent in Me Too have been very, very, uh, very much racist in nature, a number of them. And I think I have to agree. Uh, I have to agree that I think that racial concerns when it comes to Me Too, um, they're legitimate. All right. So anyway, if you want to see part three, you're going to have to go to my Patreon for that. Uh, I am charging people just $3, okay? Uh, and you get access to a lot of exclusive content that you can't find on my YouTube. So anyway, if you want to see uh, part three, I'm actually going to try to give you a lot for your money. So I'm going to read for 45 minutes and I'm just going to try to do a straight reading. Uh, no talking from me, I promise, in part three, okay? So go to the link below, sign up for my Patreon, pay five bucks, you'll get access to the third installment. Uh, and uh, yeah, okay. And uh, as always, uh, I don't know, what's my normal spiel? Like, uh, like, subscribe, tip, go to Patreon, PayPal, whatever. Okay, information is below. Bye-bye. <laughs>